Uh, my goals for today are, first of all, to solve some more examples on uh, inductance, both uh, self-inductance and mutual, and then we'll uh, do some review questions for magnetostatics. This is our last lecture on magnetostatics. We started with six weeks of electrostatics, four, this is the fourth week of magnetostatics, and then we have three weeks on Maxwell's equations on electromagnetics, because so far uh, you've seen static electric fields, static magnetic fields. When those will start changing with time, then they will become coupled, and they will give rise to electromagnetics, which will be the last part of, and Maxwell's equations, which will be the last part of the course. So for now, uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, do the following example. Find the inductance of a coaxial cable. Uh, I have uh, added a, a layer of complexity to this example. This coaxial cable has two magnetic materials in between the two conductors. So you know what the coaxial cable is. It's a sort of a TV cable. Inner conductor, outer conductor. Uh, if you want to see it from the side, it is uh, something like this. Outer conductor, inner conductor. Uh, the inner radius is A, the outer radius is C, and I have uh, just uh, to say a few things about boundary conditions, remind you a few things about boundary conditions in uh, magnetism. I have added two magnetic materials, mu1 and mu2, so there is a, a, the radius B of uh, this magnetic uh, uh, material that, um, uh, that en enclose or surrounds the inner conductor. So I hope uh, everybody understands what is uh, this structure. Uh, I show it uh, from the front view, which is on the left, and then uh, the cross section. Uh, so you see inner conductor, the, uh, the current comes out and then comes into the uh, outer conductor. So comes out from here, then comes into the board uh, on the outer conductor. If you want to see it uh, here, this is Z, the Z axis. The current flows this way on the inner conductor and then fl flows this way on the outer conductor. So imagine that this coaxial cable connects a circuit and uh, therefore you have the inner conductor uh, that uh, takes the current from the source to the load and then the outer conductor is the return path. Okay, so um, we need to find the inductance of the coaxial uh, cable. So first of all, uh, we can find the magnetic field here there is enough symmetry on the problem to apply Ampere's law. So basically we have uh, the current that flows um, in the inner conductor. Uh, we can uh, go and apply Ampere's law because this is a cylindrically symmetric structure. So we have cylindrical symmetry. And one of the things that we said about uh, cylindrically symmetric current distributions is that immediately, you never, whenever we are given a current distribution that only depends on the radial coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system, and here this is the case because we have a current only on R equals A and on R equals B. So it depends only on R, only on the distance or from the Z axis. Whenever you have such a case, then immediately you can say that the magnetic field has this general form. So this is the property of cylindrically symmetric current distributions. So here you do have cylindrical symmetry because the current um, because we have current on R equals A and R equals C, the inner and the outer conductor. So it doesn't depend on phi, it doesn't depend on Z or anything else. I can specify it just with R. If I can specify the current just with 
the radial coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system. I have a cylindrically symmetric current distribution. And then I can say that the magnetic field uh, lines are circulating around the current. And they can only depend on the distance from the, uh, from the axis. And once I have that, then I know where to apply Ampere's law. The magnetic field lines are circulating around the current. So all I need to do is apply Ampere's law on a circle. So this is the inner conductor with radius A. I have the current that flows on the conductor, on the surface of the conductor. The total current is I. That's what is uh, actually uh, given there. So I apply Ampere's law. The magnetic field is circulating. If you look at this form, is circulating around here. So I will go and apply Ampere's law along the magnetic field lines, along these circular magnetic field lines. So I go, I pick a line of radius R. And I apply Ampere's law. And Ampere's law says that H dot dl will be equal to the enclosed current, which is now the current of the conductor, which is I, the current that is carried by the inner conductor. You see, I have put it here as I. And uh, I can put it here as well as I. And the outer conductor has minus I. You can also see it right here. So the current flows right on the surface of the conductor. OK, so I have then uh, this integral on a circle. And uh, that will be, you see, I take this form. And then I have the dl on the circle. The dl will be phi r d phi. Again, if you have a question, what dl should I pick? You see that we're using cylindrical coordinates. You see that I integrate uh, along this circle. Therefore, my r is fixed and my z is fixed. So that dl cannot include dr or dz. There is only one dl that does not include dr dz, and that is dr d phi. Another way to pick that DL from your formula sheet is basically to see that here I'm running a dot product between the magnetic field and the DL. The magnetic field points in the phi direction. The DL has to point in the phi direction as well. Otherwise, this dot product would give me 0. So now that uh, I picked the right DL, phi dot phi is equal to 1, I integrate with respect to phi along the entire circle. So the phi variable goes from 0 to 2 pi. And that gives me 2 pi r h phi. And that should be equal to the enclosed current, which is i. And h phi should be i by 2 pi r. So this is the magnetic field intensity in amps per meter. And you may be wondering now, OK, I have those materials there, mu1 and mu2. How about those? Do they play any role? And the answer is yes, they play a role in the magnetic flux, not the magnetic field intensity. So the magnetic flux, which is mu times h, will be inside the first material, mu1 i by 2 pi r. And then mu2 i by 2 pi r. in the second region. So the magnetic field stays the same. The magnetic flux is what changes. Here is another question, again, sort of a review question. Is this form consistent with boundary conditions? How do the boundary conditions look like at the interface between those two media? So this is a side question. It's not about my problem. But since this is the last lecture on magnetostatics, we can as well review 
So let me put this question. Does it satisfy boundary conditions at uh, R equals B, which is the interface between those two magnetic media, mu1 and mu2? So let's uh, see. What is the boundary condition there? So here is the uh, boundary condition. The interface is at R equals B. You remember whenever we have media 1 and 2, there are two boundary conditions that we have seen. Uh, at that interface, to state the boundary conditions, you have to define the normal vector to the interface that points from medium 1 to medium 2. So the normal vector will look like this. In our case, just to take this boundary condition and specify it for the case that we are looking at, here is what we have. This is mu1. And uh, mu2. So we have the outer conductor and the inner conductor. Okay. So the normal vector to the interface looks like this, perpendicular to the interface. And what vector is this? To draw it, I connected the z-axis to the interface. So this actually is the r-hat unit vector. This is the r-hat unit vector. It's the radial, uh, the unit vector that corresponds to the radial coordinate. Because that's exactly how this looks like. You start from the z-axis, and you go outwards to the point in question. So, that uh, unit vector is the r hat unit vector. Another way to see it is that unit vectors are always perpendicular to the shapes that you define by fixing the corresponding coordinate. You fix x, you define a plane x equals fixed. The x unit vector points perpendicularly to that plane. You fix r. What shape do you define? You define a cylinder. That's the cylinder that we are talking about. So perpendicular to that cylinder is the r-hat unit vector. So uh, the boundary conditions are that n dot b2 minus b1 is equal to 0. So this, uh, this boundary condition basically means that the, perpen the normal component to the interface of the magnetic flux has to remain continuous. Normal component of the magnetic flux to the interface will have to be continuous. But here you see that we do not have any normal component of the flux. The flux is tangential, runs tangentially to the interface. Therefore, we have nothing to worry about here. The condition in this case is satisfied in a trivial way because n hat is r hat. And then we have basically phi hat. So this is anyway 0. There is no, ten, no normal component of the magnetic flux.
So the first condition is trivially satisfied here. There is not even a normal component. So it looks like 0 equals 0. So there is nothing to worry about. The second condition is that tangential h is equal to surface current density at the interface. Do I have a surface current density at this interface? Yes? No, at r equals c is the reverse i. At r equals b, there is nothing. So the outer conductor is out here. So you see I have current here. I have current here. But I don't have any current here. This is an interface between two media. So there is no current in this case. There is no current at r equals. Um, B. Current flows only on inner and outer conductor. Okay. So therefore, uh, the boundary condition says that the tangential component of the magnetic field at the interface has to be continuous. That is r hat cross phi hat h2 minus phi hat h1 has to be 0. r cross phi gives you z. So that means that the magnetic field across the interface has to remain continuous. And this is exactly what I have there. The magnetic field has just one expression for the entire region. So at the interface, it doesn't see the change in the materials. So because this interface is tangential to the magnetic flux lines, it does not affect the magnetic field. So I didn't have to worry about the materials themselves. So you see, if you look at this formula, you may be worried, where is this material that changes? Why does my magnetic field stay the same? The answer is that it stays the same because it runs tangentially to this interface, so it does not see this change in the magnetic uh, materials. So there is nothing to worry about here. If you have a situation like this, uh, we had something similar in the midterm for the electric field. So because the uh, magnetic field runs tangentially to this interface, it just remains continuous. It doesn't change. And if you look at this expression, it's exactly the same as if I had free space in between. It wouldn't change. If I had mu naught uniform or mu one or mu two or whatever in between those two conductors or any mu sub bar for that matter, or any general mu sub r, mu naught times r over a, mu naught times r squared of b squared, whatever uh, change in the magnetic permeability um, that only depends on r, then I would have this continuity and the magnetic field would be i over 2 pi r. Okay? So the change in the magnetic media affects only the magnetic flux. So now that we have this um, clarified, uh, or maybe we don't have it clarified, so I, I will stop here if there are any questions. OK, so now I will compute the inductance. for length L of the cable. So I'm taking a length L
So specific length. of the coaxial cable and I calculate the inductance. So you see the magnetic flux flows in this way. Circulates around this, uh, this conductor. And it is intercepted in the space in between. So by an area that looks like this. And therefore, I have flux that the conductor generates itself and intercepts in the space in between the two conductors. So the inner conductor generates this flux. And uh, that flux is intercepted in this area in between. So I can calculate this magnetic flux. B dot ds. So since my magnetic field is uh, mu times h, The ds that I need to uh, find is actually the ds that points in the direction of the magnetic field. And that ds, if you look again in your age sheet, there is only one ds in cylindrical coordinates that points in the phi direction. And that is phi hat dr dz. Phi hat dr dz. So phi dot phi is equal to 1. And therefore, I have to integrate dr from uh, a to c and dz from 0 to l to find the total flux. And here is the point of caution that now I have to split this integral from a to b and b to c because the magnetic permeability changes. So you see now I Indeed, see, now that I am calculating magnetic flux, I see the change in the magnetic media. So I have, uh, first of all, from this uh, dz uh, uh, factor of L, but maybe I will just do it step by step. So let's do A to B. From A to B, mu is equal to mu 1. And then I have from B to C, mu equals to mu 2, 2 pi r, dr dz. OK, so these are the uh, two integrals. So from the first one, I have uh, mu 1 by 2 pi dr over r dz. And then the second one, mu 2 over 2 pi b to c dr over r Dz. And uh, sorry, the current I forgot. So I have to put it here. So this one is uh, logarithm of b over a. This is uh, l. This also is l. This is logarithm of c over b. And all in all, I have a magnetic flux that is current times uh, mu 1 over 2 pi 
logarithm of b over a times l plus mu2 over 2 pi logarithm of c over b times l. So you see I have expressed the magnetic flux as current times a factor. That factor is the inductance that I'm looking for. So I'm done at this point. The inductance is, um, if I just uh, group the terms a little bit, length over 2 pi mu1 logarithm of b over a plus mu2 logarithm of c over b. So this is the final answer about the inductance of this coaxial cable. And again, let me make the note here that this magnetic field intensity would be the same for any for any form of magnetic permeability that would preserve the cylindrical symmetry. Cylindrical symmetry means everything you have in the problem depends on R only. On R, the, the uh, lowercase r, the radial coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system. So if uh, mu is also cylindrically symmetric, j is cylindrically symmetric, then you have uh, cylindrical symmetry and h is equal to h phi uh, of r phi hat, as we said there. Ampere's law can be applied on a circle and uh, you have continuity of the magnetic field despite the change in the magnetic media. Any questions up to this point? Okay, so I could have done, as we uh, said already, this same calculation from the magnetic energy. So this is alternative way. So the magnetic energy that is stored over this length uh, can be found from a volume integral over the entire length. Over the volume uh, between the two conductors. And um, that again has to be split. The dV, by the way, the um, Differential volume element, I work in cylindrical coordinates, so therefore I take the one for cylindrical coordinates, which is r d phi dr dz. So again, this has to be split uh, in these two regions because of the presence of mu. So I go from A to B. with mu1, the magnetic field is i squared by 4 pi squared r squared. And then I have this dv, which is r d phi dr dz. And then I go to the second region, which is extends from b to c. And it has now as mu the second mu, mu2. And then again, r d phi dr dz. And uh, there is one half here that I forgot, and I should add. Remember the magnetic um, energy density volume density in joule per meter cubed is one half mu h squared. One half mu h squared. So I can integrate this over the entire volume of the coaxial cable in order to find the energy that is stored there. And uh, you see that uh, this integral will look pretty much like the one that we had before. Uh, so if I do this uh, separately, will be one half 
Then I have the one I have the one over four pi squared from here. From here. The new one is also a constant. I can take it out. I squared is a constant. I can take it out. And I have inside integral a to b dr over r, integral from 0 to 2 pi d phi, integral from 0 to l dz. So this will give me ln b over a. This will give me 2 pi. This will give me l. Nothing surprising. The formulas will look the same as the ones before. The two methods are equivalent. So let me carry the one half here as well. Uh, same thing on this side. One half mu 2 i squared by 4 pi squared. And then I have this first integral, b to c, dr over r, because again, this partially cancels out. 0 to 2 pi d phi, 0 to l dz. So this will give me 1 half mu 2 i squared 4 pi squared ln c over b times 2 pi times l. And then the 4 pi squared and the 2 pi will cancel out partially, will give me a 2 pi. This same as well will give me 2 pi. And then all in all, I have 1 half i squared times, from this side, the first term will be mu 1 over 2 pi l and b over a times l. And from this side, mu 2 over 2 pi l and b over a, a, c over b, sorry, times l. So I know that magnetic energy in an inductor is 1 half i squared times l. So this is indeed the inductance. And you see the two methods give you the same result as they should. So either flux over current or energy equals 1 half l i squared would give you the same answer in calculating the inductance of this coaxial cable. Okay, so this is my example. Okay. Questions? So I will let this sink in and I will write the second example that I had. So my second example is a mutual inductance. Uh, so I have uh, two loops. You can see this as a charging system where I have one loop which is a charger and that uh, supports current I, so it is a circular loop, radius A, current I. This is what we call the magnetic dipole, and we found the magnetic field of this. Uh, I will use what we had found with the Biot-Savart law. And now I'm uh, trying to bring in my phone, let's say, when you do this uh, near-field payment, uh, with a cell phone or you're trying to bring a phone close to a charging station so that uh, it starts recharging wirelessly and inside the phone there is this small loop
of radius b a very small radius at height h from the main loop. So this uh, second loop can be defined by this normal unit vector n hat, uh, which has this form z cosine theta plus y sine theta. Uh, so I have this uh, small loop here. It is at a height h, and it has been turned around. As you bring your cell phone to the charger, you have a slight angle. Uh, that angle is this angle theta here with respect to the z-axis. So the question is, find the mutual inductance between the two loops. And uh, something that I'll take for granted is a calculation I did before that the main loop produces on the z-axis a magnetic field that points in the z-direction So the magnetic field of the first loop at height z equals h is equal to, and we had done this calculation before, z hat uh, current i times radius a divided by 2 times a squared plus h squared 3 halves. So we had found this. It was an example in the uh, Biot-Savart law. So this is the magnetic field at height h from uh, the loop. So because the small loop is very, very small, essentially, I can assume that the magnetic field is constant throughout the loop, that practically this small loop is on the uh, z-axis or close enough to the z-axis so since it is small that is its radius is very small I assume that H, the magnetic field from uh, the large loop, is constant throughout the small loop. So in other words, as I have the small loop like this, the magnetic flux from the main loop goes through it like this. And the magnetic field intensity does not change. I don't care about these small changes along this very, very small loop. So the magnetic field is constant and equal to z hat. Okay, so that's what I have. So that, what is now the mutual inductance? The flux through the loop so you see we have the second, we integrate over the second loop and we integrate the magnetic field of the first loop. So that is what mutual inductance means. And this is really the importance of mutual inductance. You have a primary coil and a secondary coil so the magnetic field is generated by the main loop and it is intercepted by the second loop. This is the foundational principle of things like radio frequency identification systems. All these tags that now they have at bookstores and they put them inside the books. So you go through the exit and the scanner is sending a magnetic field that has been intercepted by the tag inside the book so that uh, they can track their inventory 
automatically. How is that done? It's done with the, so how can I have uh, current, let's say, or read a signal in a circuit that doesn't have any source. They slide the tag inside your book. So the tag is just a bunch of wires. It doesn't have any source by itself. Where does this current come from? It comes from the mutual inductance between the reader and the tag. We have exactly the same principle here. I have current up here, and then I have the mutual inductance. That mutual inductance, as we will see next week, induces current on this second loop without the need for a battery right there because the flux couples from the one to the other. So the current is on the first loop, and the flux goes through the second loop. And uh, now this whole system is in free space. So it is in new node. And I have the magnetic flux density to be new node times I A Z hat. And now we have uh, one, uh, the, the only reason that I give this example is that always we dealt with magnetic flux that is normal to the area that intercepts the flux. So here we have this loop that is not normal. Uh, the normal uh, vector ds to the loop is n hat, and you see that now it is at an angle with respect to the z unit vector. Uh, but uh, the good thing is that this is a constant, so I can take it out. And now I have inside the integral z hat that this vector, which is z cosine theta plus y sine theta. And S2 is the area of the second loop. Area of the second loop. So you see this dot product, z dot z is 1, z dot y is 0. So this dot product will give you a cosine theta. So we have basically mu naught i a cosine theta 2a squared plus h squared 3 halves. And this integral over the area of the loop. And the area of the loop, the loop is circular, has radius b, is pi b squared. So then the flux that the first loop generates and the second loop intercepts is I current times mu naught A pi B squared cosine theta divided by 2A squared plus H squared 3 halves. And what you see here multiplying the current and giving you the flux is precisely what we call the mutual inductance, L12. So in this case, the first loop generates the flux, the second intercepts, and uh, now we have a mutual inductance between the two. Okay, so this was my uh, second example. Any questions? Questions? Okay, so let me then uh, close this lecture today with a few conceptual questions. Since we're talking about mutual inductance, let me start with this one. Here we have three cases of mutual inductances. Uh, and we're being asked to rank 
the three cases, the mutual inductances, uh, in uh, increasing order. So the mutual inductance here is between a wire and a loop. And uh, in the first case, the loop is, uh, as you see, on the plane of the, uh, of the board at a distance R1. In, this case, in the second case, is at a larger distance, R2. And in the third case, the loop is actually perpendicular to the plane of the, of the board. So the loop has been turned at 90 degrees. Okay. And also with this arrow here, I show you the direction of the magnetic flux from the wire because you see the wire uh, generates, as we saw before, uh, those uh, circulating magnetic flux lines. So we have mutual inductance A, B, C. Which one is the largest or the smallest? So let's start with which one is the smallest. C. C is the smallest because in case C, the mutual inductance is actually zero. This, my, this uh, loop, the way that is oriented, intercepts no magnetic flux. The mere presence of the loop does not guarantee there is a magnetic, uh, there is a mutual inductance. Here you have a situation where you have a bucket. The water just uh, flows parallel to the bucket, so you intercept no water. So the flux here is zero. Uh, the magnetic flux lines, the loop is like this. The magnetic flux lines pass over the loop. B dot ds is zero. So L12 is zero in this case. So this is the smallest. And uh, the magnetic flux here is mu naught i by 2 pi r phi hat exactly the same that we saw in the coaxial cable. You have the same situation, one wire with current I. Therefore, the closer the loop is to the wire, the stronger the magnetic flux. And therefore, in this case, you will have actually greater magnetic flux than in the second case. And of course, uh, the third case is the worst. So this is... Uh, a similar, a very similar um, uh, question is this one. Which one of the two cases would have a stronger, a higher, a greater mutual inductance and why? You see that here you will have the greater mutual inductance because you have, uh, so let's say that we follow the magnetic field lines from here, right? They would spread out. But it is much better if you are right there right the fountain and you collect all the magnetic flux. So uh, definitely the magnetic flux that would go through the loop in the first case would be weaker than the magnetic flux that goes through the loop in the first case, which will be in the second case, which is stronger. It is right there. Okay, let me uh, go to this one. A magnet with poles arranged as shown below attracts a metallic plate. Uh, sketch the magnetization, uh, forget about magnetization currents, the magnetization inside uh, the plate and inside the magnet. The magnetization. So um, this is, uh, I could have uh, asked, um, sketch the magnetic dipoles. inside the plate and inside the magnet. So obviously, whenever you have a magnetic medium, this uh, magnetic flux from the magnet is the result, not of an external current. The magnet is something you buy, and you don't need any currents to make it work. right? So it has already those aligned magnetic dipole moments that give rise to this strong flux. North on the left, south on the right, means that the magnetic flux lines externally go from north to south, like this. And because they are closed, they have to, 
close within the magnet. So within the magnet, actually, they go from south to north. That means that there are magnetic dipoles that give rise to this magnetic flux. And in order to give you magnetic flux lines that go to the left, they will have to support currents that go this way. Let me draw them properly so that you can see them. Okay, so that is, it is pretty much like this loop here that has the current and then the magnetic field goes upwards. So now, for this plate to be attracted to the magnet, that means that inside that plate there are also magnetic dipoles. That this plate basically also acts as a magnet that has its north pole here and south pole here. So therefore, it will also have magnetic dipoles that look like this. So the fundamental reason for this attraction is that goes, goes back to the fundamental observable in magnetism, that co-directional currents attract, contradirectional currents repel, magnetic levitation trains, magnetic levitation trains, contradirectional currents repel, Co-directional currents attract. And because you see that these currents are co-directional, they will attract. And that's the fundamental reason for this attractive force. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention. And we'll continue with electromagnetics next week.